Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. Today I'm interviewing a young psychiatrist, Dr Simon Ruffle, who's had an unusual career track. British trained doctor who's worked in the field of therapy for child soldiers and then has started doing research in the Amazon. Thankfully, he's returned there healthily and is now at the Institute of Psychiatry, where he's completing his training in psychiatry and also writing up his research on ayahuasca. And uh, he's going to tell me all about it today. Welcome, Simon. Hi, thanks very much. That intro sort of contrasts a little um, normal medical training to uh, what you've done. So tell us you know, how you got to do what you did then after becoming a doctor. So I've been working in the NHS as a doctor for, for a few years and I decided to take a break and was uh, working with child soldiers and that really um, spiked uh, my uh, my interest in transcultural psychiatry as so I was doing that abroad. And then uh, a few years later, I was travelling across the Americas and I came across somebody who was uh, working at a retreat centre with ayahuasca. And he told me that they had an idea to uh, to build a research centre at the retreat centre. Um, mm-hmm. So I went with him um, and I'd heard uh, loads of anecdotal evidence about people drinking ayahuasca and having these supposed, um, uh, supposedly amazingly positive outcomes. And also, you know, mm-hmm. some people having negative outcomes. Um, so I went with him and started thinking about doing some research in this area. Um, I was particularly interested in the the, the role that the tradition um, uh, surrounding ayahuasca could play with the so-called ayahuasca tourists. Um, and I was really surprised when I started looking at at the research that was out there, that there was pretty much nothing looking at ayahuasca in this setting. There are other ways that ayahuasca was being used, for example, in uh, churches uh, in, mm-hmm. in South America, like the UDV and Santa Daime, but barely anything looking at the traditional aspects uh, in, re- in retreat centres. So you went and uh, took time out from your training in psychiatry to go and do a broad research project. Who funded that? Well, so initially, uh, nobody actually. <laughs> so I ended up uh, teaming up with uh, a couple of my colleagues, Nigel Netsband and Waifang, Waifang Tang, who are psychologists. And we self-funded a small study looking at the effects of ayahuasca on personality. And we found that there were significant decreases in how neurotic people were immediately after retreats. And that this was maintained six months later. Um, but I'm pleased to say that following that, we actually did get some funding. This is our most recent project. And we started looking at outcomes relating to childhood trauma um, and memory in relation to these outcomes, um, how they're remembered. And we were looking at scales measuring depression, anxiety, and also self-compassion and mindfulness. And we were also testing people's saliva before and after retreats to see how DNA is expressed, which is a, a field called epigenetics. And we've just got some preliminary results uh, from, the, from the measures, but not from the epigenetics. Uh, so this research is actually done in traditional res- retreats in Latin America. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's all done. Uh, it's all done in a retreat center. Uh, and presumably there are people from Western nationalities or are we talking about locals? That's right. Yeah. So it's ayahuasca tourists who, uh, who uh-huh. come from around the world. And how do you deal with the fact that there are multiple languages then? I mean, or is it all done in English? Um, So it's all done in English, apart from uh, interaction with the indigenous. And we have translators who who deal with that. So the shaman is obviously an indigenous person. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Just tell us a bit about the practicalities then. You fly off to, well, Sao Paulo and then after Mineas or something, or do you go to Peru? Where do you go? Tell us more about it. Where is this retreat? Yeah, so the, the retreat centre is called, uh, it's called the Ayahuasca Foundation. It's about two, three hours outside of Iquitos, which is a, a city located in the Amazon basin. Mm-hmm. Um, but to get to Iquitos, um, there are no roads. You have to either fly in um, or go there via boat. And then mm-hmm. you have to take a, uh, the dirt road as far as you can go before taking a, a small fishing boat the rest mm-hmm. of the way until you get get to the retreat center i have a feeling my daughter was there a couple of years ago yes oh, great. That's, that, that description is quite familiar <laughs> so you get there and then you uh, how long do you spend there to get to do this research 
I was there last year for five, six months. Um, but right. most of the participants um, go on retreats that, that last from between one week to four weeks. And they drink ayahuasca normally every other day during that time. Uh-huh. And that's, is that done as a, as a group then, as part of the sort of traditional group shamanic? Experience. That's right, yeah. So there's normally about uh, between eight and ten people drinking ayahuasca at once. And they're filling out questionnaires beforehand and then the next morning, are they? Um, yeah, so we, we do the uh, the questionnaires uh, before the retreat starts, immediately afterwards, and then six months later. Um, and then that's the same for collecting saliva samples for epigenetic changes. But we're also collecting uh, qualitative data, so doing uh, interviews with the participants throughout the retreat as well. You shared with us already briefly that some of the positive changes. I mean, I guess many of the people going there are, are looking for positive change, are they? Or are they, or are they just inquisitive and sort of just testing it out as part of their uh, their growing up? <laughs> yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I think. Um, there was an interesting mix of people who were at these retreat centres. Um, so roughly uh, roughly a third of them seemed to be uh, there to try and treat a particular problem. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of them had tried uh, conventional ways of treating medicine and hadn't been very happy with the results. Um, and then there were some other people who just didn't want to engage in the kind of the, the more pharmaceutical way of, of, of treating conditions. And there mm-hmm. was uh, mm-hmm. also a small number of people who were there to try and uh, change, their, change their consciousness and experience and alter state of consciousness we've perhaps made some assumptions about our listeners uh, knowledge uh, we've kicked off with uh, this concept uh, of ayahuasca but tell people what it is sure so that's actually quite a, a complex question but uh, if we're Putting it simply, ayahuasca is a, a psychedelic brew um, which is used traditionally in the Amazon rainforest. And it's a mix of the ayahuasca vine um, and also leaves that contain DMT or dimethyltryptamine. Normally, if you were to consume DMT orally, it wouldn't do anything and because it gets broken down by enzymes that are in the stomach. But when you mix it with the vine, the vine contains things that prevent the DMT um, from being broken down. And so it's absorbed absorbed into your blood system through your stomach and makes its way to your brain and you get the uh, the psychedelic effects that you experience with ayahuasca. And how long does that take? Um, so it takes about 20 minutes, half an hour um, before the effects come on and then the ayahuasca uh, ceremony will last for about six hours. And I'm I right in thinking that you do some preparation beforehand, There's some dietary manipulations to, to maximise the, the benefits of starvation? Or yeah, something. that's right. Yeah, it's, it's not quite starvation. It's um, So normally with the retreat centres, there's a special diet that you would have to follow. And this is largely for safety. Um, oh. So you avoid certain foods, uh, such as fermented foods, because they can interact with, um, with compounds that are present in the ayahuasca. And you could get things like a, a reaction that causes high blood pressure. And you avoid certain drugs too, like antidepressants, um, mm. because this could to increase the levels of serotonin in the system uh, to dangerously to dangerously high levels. But a lot of the preparation from an indigenous point of view is uh, based around making sure that you're ready spiritually and in yourself. So you have uh-huh. a clear in- intention as to, as to why you're going to drink the ayahuasca and what you're hoping to achieve from doing so. I see. So I'm interested in the, uh, go back to that question of... Uh avoiding certain foods is that something that was worked out over the generations of of shamans then to avoid uh, fermented food yeah i would imagine so in trial and error yeah it's uh how, how long has it been around do we know um, so it's difficult to say. I think um, the earliest uh, documentation that we have um, of ayahuasca being used in the way that we're describing today in retreat centres is from roughly 150 years ago, although it was probably being used in this way before then. But other psychoactive um, uh, chemicals such as DMT have definitely been used for shamanic purposes for at least thousands of years. There was actually a, a pouch, a shaman's pouch, that was found last year that got quite a lot of attention there. Uh, contained mm-hmm. DMT, and that was found to be over a thousand years old. 
there's a lot of emphasis that's been put currently on making sure that this culture isn't lost. As ayahuasca uh, spreads uh, around the world um, and as more people are coming to drink ayahuasca in the jungle, there's a huge emphasis around um, maintaining the ceremony as it's a really you know, powerful and beautiful thing and perhaps there are things mm. that we can learn from that too. Mm. Uh, so that's something I think that's really important when you're engaging in these ceremonies and you're, and you're doing this research to kind of to be aware of, uh, of how, how important the tradition is. Let's explore that a little bit more then. So, I mean, clearly there's, there's a guide, there's, there's a shaman who is introducing the construct and taking people into it. And, and do they do interpretations as well? Or is it, is it are they there simply to uh, be part of the history? Or are they actually therapists at the same time? Yeah. So it's interesting when we think about the role of the, the shaman compared to a therapist or a doctor. I think that a lot of the work that the shamans do is to try and provide the participants um, with the tools that they need in order to to help themselves um, in in the long term rather than just giving a, a short term fix so i think there is interpretation but it's also interpretation through a different cultural lens so for example the way that the shaman might describe something such as depression might be the saying that you have a, a negative energy uh, within you rather than, than we might say oh you you are depressed yeah, I know. I see what you're saying. I mean, I, but I think you were sort of alluding to the their extra value that is potentially brought to this kind of uh, or through this kind of process compared with maybe you know, even what we do in the West when we're using psychedelics and therapy, which is individual therapy with traditional psychologists, psychiatrists sitting. I mean, do you think there? Do you think the group therapy, the shamanistic ritual, might actually give you greater benefits than what we're doing at present. I think so, yeah. I think that the uh, the whole ceremonial aspect and the emphasis that's put on on that setting is really designed to allow you to go as deep as possible into into your process, into yourself, um, in order to to gain some insights into into your condition. And I think that you know a lot of the the work, the studies that we're doing into things like uh, psilocybin here in here in London, are putting an emphasis on maybe a different kind of ceremony, um, but also into into the setting. But there's something about being completely unplugged for a prolonged period of time, being in nature, um, the role of the music or ikaros, which are the shamanic songs that are sung, which um, I think could play um, a really important role in, in the healing that, that you get from ayahuasca. You talked as if some people... They will have repeated sessions every maybe every couple of days, is that right? The way that these retreats work is that um, people come and they uh, they drink ayahuasca every other day for a number of weeks. That's not actually the way that ayahuasca would have been used normally um, in the indigenous communities. That's more of a, a Western a Western way of, of doing things. Um, but yeah, that's the way the retreat centres work on the whole. We're discovering in our uh, current trial of psilocybin that... Um, where we're giving people two relatively powerful trips the three weeks apart, we're discovering the content can be extraordinarily different between each one. I don't know whether there's any research being done on what happens when you keep on taking ayahuasca. Do the effect wear off, get better, change? Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. So. And what we found with uh, each of the studies that we've done is that it doesn't, the amount of times that you take ayahuasca, it doesn't seem to be having that much of an impact on the outcomes from the studies. Uh, so, so we were hypothesizing that the, the longer the retreat, the greater the decreases we would see in things like depression and anxiety. But that just wasn't the case. And, and maybe that's mm -hmm. a reflection on the, the scales, the way that we're, we're measuring these things, or maybe people were getting the benefit they needed from just a few sessions. I mean, would you, is that something that you would think we're confident to recommend to people with depression at present? I, I don't think I can, I can recommend it. You know, the role of this research isn't, mm. isn't to recommend it, it's more to add to the growing body of, of evidence that we have surrounding the use of, of, um, mm. of these substances. And of course, there's, there's also this tension developing between whether it's a, this is a sort of entertainment. I mean, if you go back, of course, to the, to the history of the, uh, the psychedelic mushrooms in Mexico. I mean, that culture was pretty much destroyed once every, once the, the rich and famous decided to go and uh, and partake of that. Uh, and uh, and you know, is there a f 
a worry. I mean, where there is a worry, I don't know to what extent you share that worry that uh, mm. by commercialising ayahuasca retreats, you might in, end up somehow devaluing the, the the indigenous culture and approach. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's a really good point. Um, I think that the way an ayahuasca is uh, used has changed dramatically over the last 10, 20 years. Um, it's still being used as a medicine, but um, you know it's being used for lots of other things now. And there was even an article about ayahuasca that came out in Vogue a little while ago, and interestingly, it fell into the the lifestyle section rather than any other section, yes. which I think kind of shows just where we're at. But the importance of the ceremony and the tradition can't be overlooked and hopefully through doing research um, looking at the tradition we can we can show that importance and then we can mm. work with indigenous communities uh, to try and protect that whether or not you agree with it ayahuasca is spreading and there's a certain responsibility to try our best to to hold on to that tradition and how do you think we can kind of get that balance right protecting people who are who might be Seduced into what well, price reductions, you know, two for one, uh, less <laughs> competent shamans. How do how do we sort of try to get that balance right between you know between what's what's the sort of the best and you know, how do we cope with the demand, which could lead people to cutting corners and doing things which we know have happened, like adding relatively toxic drugs like scopolamine to the cocktail. I think that's really a um, an argument for for regulation. Um, so at the moment, um, yeah. there's there's no regulation for ayahuasca, but that in itself also brings issues with it. I think it's really important when we're thinking about the spread of ayahuasca like this to consider reciprocity and and you know what what we're giving back um, to the indigenous communities mm. when mm. when we're using ayahuasca. And, you know, it's quite easy to give money for sure, but giving a large amount of money to an indigenous community could potentially just stabilize it mm-hmm. and so there are uh, there are charities you can give to at the research center we give to a charity called rain that promotes um the uh, protection of indigenous cultures and also reforestation and um, but it's yeah it's something that needs to be given real thought um, when we're considering Absolutely. the spread of ayahuasca but in terms of you mentioned the concept of regulation. I think that, as you say, would be tricky. I mean, is there any mm. kind of accreditation at present? Do we know? No, 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 no. Not, um, not in the jungle. And I yeah. think this is really tricky because to become a, a shaman, a curandero, it's it's like becoming a you know a psychiatric doctor, or a psychotherapist, mm. or a psychologist. Mm. It takes years and years and years and years. But there isn't anything apart from reputation uh, to to show uh, to show this qualification. I think this is where a lot of the horror stories come from, and where a lot of people go wrong, as there's quite a lot of money that's um, that's present in the ayahuasca tourism industry, mm. and therefore you can't necessarily blame people for for trying their luck at trying to make a, mm. a psychedelic mm. brew um which which goes wrong mm. you've explained uh, already how the, the shaman and the setting and the group experience and uh, and the repetition perhaps of dosing is all likely important in how uh, how people get benefits but there's also the question of ayahuasca itself and do you think ayahuasca is in some ways different perhaps from other psychedelics like psilocybin Obviously, there are some um, some similarities between uh, ayahuasca and psilocybin. So, if we look at the the main psychedelic component of, of ayahuasca DMT, it's a, it's a very similar chemical to psilocybin. But there are also some other things that are in ayahuasca and, um, that help with with mental health problems. Um, so, for example. In the ayahuasca vine, there are many chemicals, one of which is called uh, tetrahydrohamine, which contains um, a weak SSRI, so a weak antidepressant. And I think just because of the complexity of the brew, um, uh, there are lots of other things that are going on which could lead to the positive effects that we're beginning to see. We'll get back to the interview in just a second. I just want to thank all the Drug Science Community members for your continued support. Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a Drug Science Community member, you'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all Drug Science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I was speaking with Dennis McKenna the other day, and uh, he was saying some of his research in the um, 
the churches there suggest mm. that uh, there might be enduring beneficial changes in serotonergic density, receptor density, transporter density, which potentially yeah. could be dr- driven either from the uh, the ayahuasca or some other element, and not just the DMT itself. So, so that's again, you know, another yeah, for sure. interesting thing to research, and maybe your. Uh, your epigenetic studies for, on the saliva will uh, give us some pointers there as well. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'm sure you'll be looking at it. But there's also this other, maybe perhaps fundamental aspect of uh, of a, an ayahuasca ceremony, which is it is part. Of, you're doing it in nature. It's part of nature. You're not stuck in a hospital bed. Mm. And uh, the churches that are developed in in Brazil also seem to have. A, mm a strong affiliation uh, with nature. You, is that something that you've noticed, experienced, want to share, or comment on? Absolutely. I think this is something that's going to be really important moving forward with the, uh, the, the trials that are happening with psychedelics in general. Um, connectedness to nature seems to be a really integral theme that comes up with the use of psychedelics. And although some of the studies that we're doing at Kings and Imperial are putting emphasis on on the setting of the rooms, as you say, David, they're still in a hospital. Um, and I think there is something around being in nature that can um, that can really help with the therapeutic process and maybe improve outcomes. Uh, so moving forward, that's something that I think we're going to have to uh, put emphasis on uh, with the use of psychedelics as hopefully they come into medicine. And I suppose the reality is thinking about it. I mean, it, if you're saying at least 150 years of proven use, and I, I guess relatively few, if any, serious adverse effects from ayahuasca that anyone can recognise, it seems to be a remarkably safe drug. Yeah, there was a study that was done a little while ago, actually, looking at the rates of psychosis um, in members of uh, an ayahuasca church uh, in Brazil called the UDV. And they found that actually, uh, on average, the uh, rates of psychosis compared to the general population were lower, as were the rates of um, anxiety and depression. So I think it is very safe as long as appropriate screening and preparation has taken place. Mm. I think if you have underlying conditions, um, such as psychotic conditions like schizophrenia, it could potentially be a bit of a disaster. Um, so we need to uh, we need to be careful when we're when we're screening. Again, there might be a dose related effect here. I mean, as I understand it, the, the doses or the, the used in the church ceremonies are people aren't having extreme hallucinations. They're not having um, powerful psychedelic experiences. They're more they're getting more of a sort of sense of um, togetherness and. Cohesion is, 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 is that correct? I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, but you are. Yeah, that's that's right. It's um, it's almost a different way of using the ayahuasca. So, right. the doses are normally smaller on the whole than the ones that are used um, in the Amazon. But the churches normally meet every two weeks, and they do that just you know ongoing. They meet every two weeks and and drink ayahuasca. And there's some interesting evidence that um, that the the afterglow effects from ayahuasca may be lasting for about two weeks. So mm-hmm. so it makes sense that uh, that they would be drinking uh, regularly. So it's more of a, a little and often in the churches rather than the very very heavy doses that we see in, in the Amazon rainforest. So They've, they've, they've optimised the dosing regime to get, for well-being and, uh, yeah, that's and right. uh, self-healing and that. No, cool. So you've come back from there now and you've, uh, you've got back onto the career ladder in Britain as a, as a psychiatrist. Uh, yeah, so to speak, yeah. I'm quite interested to know how, uh, how the people that uh, interviewed you for your new job. <laughs> I certainly remember when I, was, uh, when I was starting my training in psychiatry to express an interest in psychedelics meant that they kind of almost rejected you out of, the, out of hand. But here you're coming back, mm. not, you know, not just having expressed an interest, but also having done research. I mean, how has psychiatry as a profession received you back i think i think even in the last five ten years you know that times have changed quite a lot and uh, it's certainly something that when i started doing started doing this research working on the, the psychedelic trials at uh, king's um, with psilocybin and this ayahuasca research that i was i was a bit nervous about but i think that you know psychedelic research is now you know it's now reasonably highly regarded i mean there's a psychedelics trials group at both kings and imperial so i don't think it's um, as left field as it once was um and so i haven't had any um uh, any negative consequences from doing this research in fact uh, only positive um, and people seem to have a, a genuine interest um, and, and want to know more and why do you think that is i think it's probably because 
people are very open to discovering uh, new ways or as it may be old ways of treating mental health problems <laughs> and um and the way the the psychedelic research is going at the moment it shows that psychedelics might be one way of doing this and so i think if you're you know are, are a good scientist you'd be open to that you'd look at the data and see what it says Yes, of course, it does require to have an open mind. You can, it's very easy to look at the data and say, well, all, almost all the trials are uncontrolled and the ones that are controlled are quite tiny. So, you know, this is just a, another group of uh, leery-like enthusiasts trying to pull the wool over eyes like they did 50 years ago. But, uh, but at least at King's, you went to the right place, I suppose, because there is, as you say, a, a very good centre now for psychedelic research there. That's Just, right, yeah. I'm not entirely sure how easily it's going to be to roll out to the places which don't have quite such a strong uh, sort of research uh, tradition. And also the open-mindedness. But the point you make also, though, that, um, I mean, psychiatry is a, is a difficult discipline and there are, we haven't had great innovations in terms of treatment in, in very many decades. Certainly some psychiatrists, I think, are just hoping that this will be the breakthrough that it perhaps promised to be back in the 50s and 60s and then... Uh, mm sadly was sort of squashed by uh, all sorts of political machinations. Yeah. So can you see us starting to do ayahuasca research in the UK then? Would that be something you'd want to do? This is this is a good question. So there has been, uh, there's been one randomised control trial with ayahuasca um, that was done in a lab-based setting um, in Brazil. Um, and then there's also um, other trials that have been done with free stride ayahuasca in Barcelona. So I think it is a possibility um, to look at ayahuasca in this setting. I mean, for me, the most exciting thing about this research is the tradition and the ceremony that surrounds it mm. um and so I, I just think that you might lose something by mm. not having that tradition and in many ways when i think about you know what is what is ayahuasca i mean is it is it just the substance i mean to a certain degree it is it's the chemicals but i think it's also everything that comes with it it's mm. the the maloka the shaman the temple where you drink it the ikaros mm. the music the being unplugged all of that that leads to the therapeutic outcomes um so i would definitely be interested in looking at ayahuasca in this setting but for me looking at the Amazonian setting is uh, yeah is really interesting but of course if it turns out that you're right that um, there's a real added value to uh, to doing it in a traditional settings it can be difficult to roll out to all the people in the western world who need it <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know maybe there are, maybe we can your virtual reality maybe I don't know maybe that's a that's a way of sort of kind of bridging the Atlantic somehow. Yeah. Who knows? But, Who knows where the future will take us? Well, hopefully you're going to be part of it. I probably won't be, but, uh, but you know, if fortune favours you, there's a good chance you will be too. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, some people, could, you could argue that maybe, well, we should be trying to do it in the, in the UK or in the West because, firstly, we can do it more scientifically. We can do things like we're doing, which is imaging, which would potentially... You know, it's another way of looking at what's going on in terms of the neuroscience of uh, these mm, um, mm. experimental changes. But also, I mean, if you know, if it turns out that you discover from your the studies you've already done that uh, there are significant biological changes in, say, the epigenetics, you know, and if you're right that, that part of it is due to the uh, the setting and the the place and the shape, and then you'd have to do a control over here with something bit more biological just to, to prove your point wouldn't you yeah yeah for sure i think that you know these these studies that we're doing at the moment are good at uh, suggesting what might be happening um but as you say it's with the nature of these uh, these observational studies it's really difficult to separate what is making the change um, and also I, I got a question would you would you completely want to do that but i i agree if we're gonna if we're going to be more serious with, with ayahuasca in the UK, then some control trials uh, would be needed. But there are some brain imaging studies that are happening with ayahuasca at the moment in places like Barcelona so, and, and Brazil. Mm. And so some data surrounding that does exist. No, no, and I think they tend to be showing similar similar changes to... Uh, yeah, that's right. ...to those of Simon. But of course, the, the big challenge we have from in our research at present, and I, I imagine the same will be true of the King's Group, uh, that... The effects of psilocybin are powerful, but not permanent. 
mm. and how to maintain them, how to how to try to keep hold of them and stop de- whatever the depression is eating them, or eating away at them, is is actually that's the biggest. That's my biggest challenge at present, because it's extraordinary sad to see someone make a phenomenal recovery under a single psilocybin exposure. But only then, three months later, to have slipped back for the depression to have kind of consumed them again and, and not, not have not have access to it. So uh, any any learnings we can have from ayahuasca that might help us think through how we could maintain wellness would be really welcome. And, and, and maybe maybe partaking of a, an ayahuasca drink every couple of weeks would be a really sensible prolongation. I mean, that would be quite a nice trial, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. There are some trials looking at the ayahuasca churches that have shown a great, great benefit. And that's a, mm. another different form of, of ceremony and, you know, a, a tradition within its own right um, that definitely is very interesting at looking at. I understand what you're saying about ceremony. I'm, not, I'm you know, very sympathetic to it, but it, it might not be so appealing to you know, the average Brit who's been chronically depressed. And maybe mm. we need to find our own ceremonies. Maybe, um, and actually, to some extent, that's what psychiatry is, isn't it? And, you know, the, the psychotherapist has a kind of, in part, a ceremonial role in, in terms of initiating and facilitating um, the getting better. And I mean, maybe we could, sure. you know, maybe we could be doing something, you know, more down that route with our own trained, experienced individuals like yourself. You know, maybe you could coordinate fortnightly meetings uh, where people took took ayahuasca brew and actually you know talked about the problem i mean i don't know i mean i think the idea i mean the idea that psychedelics facilitate psychological change is it must be established there can't be people that deny that now i don't think so mm-hmm. it's the question of how best we can make that available <laughs> and, and 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 that, uh, to my mind, that is the that is the biggest challenge at present. If we're, Absolutely, I mean, that's definitely an interesting idea. Do you have any idea what that might look like? Well, I was just thinking, you know, that uh, we're all very comfortable with group therapy in psychiatry. Well, maybe you could have group therapy with ayahuasca, the mug of ayahuasca at your side. Yeah, uh, before I mean, it might be it might be difficult to do the therapy when the when the effects of ayahuasca <laughs> are. Um, are, are actually present, but definitely, um, you know, integration afterwards um, and, and and therapy beforehand as preparation is uh, is a really good a really good. But option. I was thinking more of the uh, the lower dose. I mean, one mm. one scenario I've been contemplating with uh, maintaining wellness after a psilocybin experience would be to do microdosing. Yeah, uh, you know, because these drugs are illegal, microdosing is actually harder to do than macrodosing, and much yeah, more expensive yeah. because you've got to administer in a hospital, etc. But, but if we were to get rid of the stupidity of the laws, then you know, maybe a, maybe a microdose or maybe a, a mini dose uh, or a midi dose, you know, ten milligrams or the equivalent of that in ayahuasca every fortnight or every month, in a setting where you could be protected in case anything did go wrong, but also have facilitation of insights. That might be an interesting way of trying to maintain wellness. For sure. I mean, well, there definitely aren't any studies looking at that at the moment, but I have come across some uh, some anecdotal evidence of people microdosing uh, ayahuasca and, and having positive uh, positive outcomes. Uh, so who knows? Uh-huh. Maybe that would be yeah. a, a good study to do looking into the future. Well, I'd be very happy if you were to, to write that grant, and I'd be very happy to referee it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> Well, Simon, it's been lovely to talk to you, and uh, it's quite challenging, I know, to do research as well as train in psychiatry. Um, if you can do both, you know, I really uh, encourage you to do both because we need people like you to pursue this uh, very exciting new sort of future of, uh, of psychedelic psychiatry. So thank you for joining me, and uh, the very best it's in your It's been career. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for listening. I think you will agree that was an interesting conversation. You're hearing me, you hear one of the father figures, and but and let's start that one again. Well, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. It was lovely to hear from a young psychiatrist who's hopefully going to make a significant impact on the field over the next 20 or 30 years. And uh, it's reassuring that people who are developing treatments such as ayahuasca for psychiatry are so interested in doing research on it as well so i hope you'll enjoy the uh, interview as much as i did and if you have then obviously share with your friends and family tweet about it but most importantly please go on to the 
drugscience.org.uk website. And there you can pick up all the other podcasts. And uh, if you feel so inclined, become a Drug Science community member. That gives you access to everything we do and also helps you support the important work of drug science. So thanks for doing that and uh, listen in for the next podcast. Bye-bye.